Hello, and welcome to the June 2018 update of the Power BI Desktop. As always, lots of exciting features to talk about this month, and we're going to start with the reporting features. First on our list is an accessibility feature. We now support high contrast settings in the reports themselves. So I'm going to show you for this one both the our web service and the desktop experience because they're both a little bit different. So first I'm going to start with the desktop. So if this is my report and how it looked normally. If I needed high contrast colors, I would go and I would first set those, of course, in my window system settings. And there are four default settings that uh, types of high contrast themes that are available in Windows. So I'm just going to jump into high contrast number one. And I'm going to apply that. And you'll notice across all my settings, I am now getting that high contrast uh, theme applied. And now if I go back to the Power BI desktop, you're going to notice two things when I first jump over. Uh, first, you'll see that all of the charts have changed, but the background image has not. Uh, that's an important thing, and I did this on purpose to point this out. If you, in general, images do not do well whenever you're in high contrast mode across not just desktop, Power BI desktop, but any tool. So if you do want your, your reports to be very accessible, I don't recommend background images. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over to a duplicate of this page, but with no background image. And you're going to see that what happens was not we took over the background, so it was originally a gray color, and it now is this default black. And that came from the high contrast settings, the high contrast theme that I selected in my settings. And all of my charts are now in a yellow text color, and that includes all of the outlines of all of my colors. And you'll notice that if you are a high contrast user, this experience, is, experience matches basically exactly what Excel does for their charts. You lose all the colors and you get a nice bold outline around the data points so it's very clear where all the data points are. So in the Power BI desktop, whatever those system colors are, are going to flow directly into your report and be used across the entire report. You will notice, however, that there are still some pieces of the desktop that are not high contrast. There's some that are, like the, in addition to the report, the ribbon, but certain pieces of the desktop, like our panes, are not yet high contrast. We will be continuing to work on this and um, add support for high contrast across the entire desktop in the coming months. I mentioned earlier that in the Power BI service, things are slightly different. So now let's go and look at this exact same page on the Power BI service. So here I am in the Power BI service, and you'll notice, one, the service in general, because it's in a web browser, is fully supportive of high contrast now. All of the, the bars and the ribbons and all of these options are high contrast, which is great. Um, there are far fewer gaps here. Even the filter pane is high contrast in here. And by default, your theme will automatically be applied to the report in the desk and the Power BI service as well, similar to the experience on the desktop. However, um, depending on what browser you're using, browsers can have various um, Ver browsers can have various support for high contrast mode, so uh, sometimes we can't tell because of the browser you're using exactly which high contrast theme you applied through your settings. So if we couldn't tell, we will do our best to guess and apply it, but if you do need to fix it and you want to set a very specific high contrast theme, you can go under the view tab in the service and you'll see there's this new high contrast colors option, which you can select, and you can override the high contrast theme to match whichever one you wanted to use that we could not figure out because of the browser you're using. So if instead I want to use high contrast two, you can set that and it will automatically apply the settings from the high contrast two theme. And the colors we're using for each of those options directly pair to the, the theme colors that you would have gotten if you were um, using that theme from your system settings. So you would get a one-to-one -one match there.
And in the Power BI service, the, these high contrast color options are available all the time, not just when your system is in high contrast mode. So if you do want to just try out this to see what it's going to look like for, say, if you don't need high contrast mode but your consumers do, and you want to be able to make sure it looks good for your consumers, you can use under this view tab, you can switch to whatever theme you want, and it will adjust everything on the report page to match just the report page, not the rest of the Chrome, to match whatever theme you had selected from the dropdown. So I'm just going to go and real quickly set my settings back to none for high contrast. And now that my uh, settings are all back to normal, I'm just going to go ahead and jump right back to the Power BI report. And you'll notice now it looks just how it had before, with no nothing different. The nice gray backgrounds, the white colors I have personally picked. All of my settings are just back to normal now. This month we have several formatting features available as well. The first of which is control over your donut radius. And for the donut chart, what this means is how basically how fat or skinny your donut chart is. So I will just jump into my report to show you how to edit that. So let's take this donut chart. And under the formatting pane, we now have a shapes card. And in the shapes card, you're going to have an inner radius option. And it defaults to 60%, which is um, what it, its default is today. And then I can go and I can make the percentage whole a lot smaller. And so it becomes more, not a pie quite, but a lot closer to it in shape. Or I could go the opposite way and make my donut super, super skinny and narrow, which Maybe something I would really like to do if I want to say layer a card inside the the donut chart to kind of have like a KPI effect for the donut. So I can adjust that however much I want to fit to fit uh, the look and feel I'm going for for my report. The next formatting feature is a option for both pie and donut charts. And it is much more flexibility in terms of my detail labels. So for both pie and donut, we have some basic controls like color the labels. Um, is it the number value? Is it the percentage? Is it the category? Is some combo of the three? But we are extending that to have a few more options as well this month, specifically focused around positioning of the labels. So if I jump back to that same donut, and I go into the detail labels card, you'll see that I now have at the bottom of the card, I have this pos label position option and it defaults to outside. But now I could do things like say, I want my labels always inside my donut chart and they will immediately, you lose the leader lines and they'll immediately jump inside with the background. I can also do things like instead of just say, forcing them always outside or forcing them always inside, I can also give a preference. So I can say I prefer my donut labels to be inside, but if they're not going to fit, you can put them outside of the of the the donut or pie as well. And, so, and the reverse is true for the prefer outside. So I'll pick prefer inside, and nothing changes right now because they do mostly fit. But that's mo only because I do have also the overflow text option on, and if I turn that off. You'll notice that two of the labels, once they could no longer overflow outside the shape that was available to them, they now jump outside because they could no longer fit. And for the, the inside option as well, you do get some control over the background. Like say I want to turn the background off for the labels that are inside, I can do that as well. And like I mentioned earlier, these options are available for both pie and donut charts. And so this just gives you much more flexibility in terms of how your, both your pie and donut labels look on your pie chart. The last formatting feature this month is a huge update to the data labels for combo charts. We're going to now let you format the data label separately for each measure that's being used. So for either the lines or for the bars, which We've already supported, and you might know this feature already, for co column charts and for line charts, and we're finally bringing combo chart forward to support this as well. So let me show you that in action. 
if I go over to this um, this combo chart and I look at the data labels card we now have we've already had all of these formatting capabilities available to you but they always applied to both and which could be problematic in some cases for combo chart because you for example the if you want to change your display units what might make sense for the line probably doesn't actually make sense for the the columns as well and so we now have this customize series option at the bottom of the the data labels card and when you turn that on you get a, a replica of many of the formatting features that we have available and a drop down above it that tells you what specific measure you're formatting that for so for example my line is units and for lines specifically, I want to have the display units be none so that I get the full number. And then on sales amount, I'm going to want to make the background 100% transparent and make the, the text color be white because I think that shows up best whenever they're inside the bars. And so now I have that extra layer of flexibility to get the data labels perfect for the positions and type of data that they are. The last reporting feature this month is an improvement to phone reports. If you don't know what phone reports are, they are a feature that lets you design a very specific layout for any given report page to be viewed whenever a consumer is consuming your report and their and on their phone, whenever they're just holding a phone like normal in the vertical layout you'll, you'll have this custom layout that works best for that orientation and for this month we are basically doubling the size of the grid available to you for phone reports previously you would have if you think about how many squares high the phone report was in the grid it was about 20 high we're doubling that to 40 rows high on the grid so let me just give you a quick demo of phone reports to point out the longer option that we have. So if I jump into, let's just go back to my uh, plain old gray page real quick. If I jump into phone reports, which is found under the view tab, you'll see that I have this grid here and it is, like I said, double the length it was before. You would only have 20 rows of the grid previously and now we have 40, which gives you much more flexibility. And just like always, you can drag all of whatever charts you want to be available in this option. You can drag it and scale it and align it to the grid and just do that for whatever charts you want to, be, to have available to your consumers in this layout. And of course, they could always flip the orientation of their phone if they wanted to get the true normal layout for the report as well. The next section of features both focus on modeling. The first of which is filtering and sorting in the data view. So if you've ever used Power Pivot in Excel, you, you know that they have excellent filtering and sorting abilities per column. We've now finally, finally carried those feature options into the Power BI desktop. So let me show you. So if I go into the data view for my report, you'll see that I have lots of columns available here. And for each individual one, I can choose to filter it out. So for example, I can filter out the United States and hit OK. And now all the United States is, a, is filtered out of my data view. And you'll notice that the little symbol is here to tell me that that filtering has occurred on that column. I can go in and I can clear the filter. And I can also do advanced filtering. Set. So if, if I go to text filters, I can go and say, I can do equals, does not equal, starts and ends with, contains, does not contain, custom filtering, all of those good advanced filtering. So if I go starts with, and let's go with, I want it to start with any country that starts with a G, so that should be both Germany and Great Britain. And if I hit OK, now my data is filtered to just those two. And I can do this also for other columns. You notice here's a date column and it has um, options like before and after, between, and the type of filtering available specifically to the type of column that I am selecting on right now. 
I can also specifically ch change the sort order per column. So let's say I wanted to sort this ascending. And now my data is all sorted ascending. And I get a nice little arrow next to the caret drop down that tells me that this is the column I am sorting by and what direction it's, it is currently sorting on. The status at the bottom is also nice because we'll tell you how many rows you have and how many uh, filtered rows there are. And um, this gives me even extra information whenever I'm using these features to just peruse my data, see what's available, what's not, get a better feel for what's actually in my data model. The other feature that we have around modeling this month is improved locale formatting. So if I have data that's and it's formatted specifically to the locale I'm using on my machine, I'm going to see much better support for that, both in the Power BI desktop and the service. Specifically, this is around locales that are to a very specific region or country. So, for example, uh, take Spanish. There is, of course, the Spanish in Spain, and there's also Spanish in Mexico. And the data formatting between those can be different, so that they use decimal point, or the period point, and the comma, differently between those two uh, variants of Spanish. And previously, if I had been using the, the Mexico-specific variant of Spanish, it would, the locale formatting would have actually fallen back to the Spain variant, and I wouldn't be getting the data formatting that I am used to by default. Of course, you know, you can go in in the model and change it to be specific to what you want, but if you were using that default formatting for the based off your locale, there was many types of locales where we are falling back to a different variant that might not have matched the way that your variant of a language uses it. So we now actually support an additional over 600, I think it's 670, if I remember correctly, new variants of locales across both the desktop and in the service. Uh, one thing I do want to mention here is just that, like I said, this is the default formatting. So if I go over to my report, and let's say it's this date here in the modeling tab, you need to be using this default one that has the little, the little star right next to it that says that that's the default variant. If you go and you specify one spe specific layout for your data, this won't apply because you are sp specifying, of course, a specific layout and we'll always respect what you specify. We also have two new custom visuals this month, the first of which is an organizational chart. So if I switch over to the sample file that comes with that, with this custom visual, you'll see that it is in fact a organizational chart. So you can see that there's a tree-like structure where you can specify who within your organization is at the top and how does the chain look going all the way down. And for each node, there is, of course, a way you can expand and collapse for it to grow. And it's actually quite a nice tree-like structure. And if you're curious about how the data looks for this chart, you'll see that for each row, so each thing, you need to give it, of course, a ID to represent it. So in this case, it was 0 through 18. And then you need to reference for each of, that, each of those IDs, who does that person or object or whatever point to in the tree structure. So if, in this case, let's say there are people, that person number five and four both report to person number two. And if you give both of those IDs, so the ID, the, the ID for a given node and the parent ID, the visual will be smart enough to automatically create that tree structure. You can also give it a level and an image, so like this little money bag and this person as well, and a link to go to for some of them whenever they're clicked on as well. And of course, there are lots of formatting options, so you can pick different layouts for it. Um, you know, you can flip it or do whatever works best for your layout for your data. You have control over how the nodes look, how big they are, what do the labels look like, all the, the good format capabilities that you would expect for a custom visual. So if you have um, organizational structure data where you need a good tree layout, this is definitely an excellent visual to try out for your data. The second custom visual is called China Heat Map. And if you remember last month, we had a 
a China color map, and this is basically that same custom visual but with a heat map layer applied on top instead of coloring the different regions themselves. So if I jump to the sample, you'll see that they have a good map that matches you know, all the different regions of China, and you get a nice hover effect as you go over each of the different regions, and you'll see on top of there is a, a heat map effect for each of those regions, and there's even this nice uh, scale that you can see on the left here that lets you pair what color it is to actual data values. And as you hover, you're able to pick out, kind of hover over whatever layer color you have and see about what that number pairs to. Um, and of course, there are some formatting capabilities as well for this, such as like a blur size, opacity, things like that. So if you are trying to visualize data and and the different regions of China, this is definitely a good map to try for that. For data connectivity, we have some major improvements for four different connectors this month. The first connector I'm going to talk about is our SAP Business Warehouse connector. And for this connector, the first improvement is that we have a new driver that we're using. And as part of this new implementation, which we've labeled 2.0, you're going to see some massive performance improvements along with a lot of other great new options. So for any new connections in the SAP BW connector dialog, you'll have the option to select implementation 2.0. And if you use, do that um, while creating a new connection, we'll switch from, use, from using the SAP client driver to a new SAP BW driver developed by Microsoft. And there are significant connector improvements that come along with this. Like I mentioned, performance improvements are going to be there, and they're, they're quite impressive, the performance improvements you're going to see. You'll also be able to retrieve several million rows of data and fine-tuning and fine -tuning ability through the batch size parameter. You'll also have the ability to switch execution modes. You also have support for compressed mode, which is especially beneficial for high latency connections or large data sets. You also have improved detection of date variables. And as an experimental feature, we're actually going to expose date and time dimensions as date and times respectively instead of as text values. There is better exception handling so the errors that occur um, are now surfaced appropriately. And you're also going to get column folding in, uh, in two different modes that we have. So for example, if the generated MDX query retrieves 40 columns but the current selection only needs 10, this request will be passed onto the server to retrieve a smaller data set. So big list of features, lots of exciting improvements with that. Uh, implementation 2.0 does have a new prereq, which is the SAP.NET Connector 3.0 which you can download from SAP's website. Um, we have a link to that in the blog that you can go and access and reach. The connector does come in 32-bit and 62-bit versions, and you need to pick the one, this is important, you need to pick the one that matches your Power BI download. So if you're using the 64-bit version of Power BI Desktop, please download the, the corresponding version of this um, .NET connector. And there are instructions for all of this in the blog if you want to check that out. And we also have documentation for it as well. We also have, as a separate update for the SAP BW connector, um, we have made improvements to hierarchy variables, input UX, and the navigator dialog, and the edit variable screen. So that whenever you're modifying your selection for a hierarchy node variable, for example, U.S. state, dependent variable fields, value fields, such as city, are updated to only contain values defined within the selected hierarchy node. The second connector I'm going to talk about today is our Spark connector, which now supports window authentication. So whenever you specify a server you want to connect to, you can now provide as a new auth method your Windows authentication credentials in addition to the previous basic option that we had. And Windows Auth support allows you to specify 
the, whatever current credentials you're using or specify alternate credentials as well. You can also additionally specify the realm, host fully qualified domain name, and service name parameters, which are required in order to establish the connection to Spark clusters. The third connector on my list is our OData connector. And for this connector, we've this month, we've made significant improvements to provide richer support for OData v4. The first improvement you're going to get with this is improved support for complex types. The new experience for complex type properties is now much like that for navigation properties. So complex singleton properties can now themselves contain navigation properties and complex collections are now imported as nested tables. The second update for this connector is open type navigation columns. So while existing OData connectors has long supported importing extra data properties from an OData feed as open type columns, the enhanced connector extends this to also support importing extra navigation properties, whether dynamic or from a derived type. In many cases, we will still be able to fold even after these navigation properties. The third improvement is uh, improved support for custom URLs. So users who prefer to specify OData query options manually will find that the enhanced connector adjusts the type of the imported table according to the response. There are also significant performance improvements and also greater resiliency. So if, there, if the, a folded query fails, the enhanced connector is going to retry with less folding. And this allows more queries to succeed without completely giving up on the imp improved performance from folding. The last connector on our list is the ODBC connector. And there are two improvements this month. The first is we now have folding support for top rows. So the keep top rows op option will be pushed down to the ODBC driver, which may improve performance of the connector if the driver and underlying data source support the top operator. And the second improvement is the ability to filter navigation by DSN catalog. So the DSN or connection string specified on the ODBC connector dialog includes a D DSN catalog. Power Query will narrow down the list of tables exposed in the navigation dialog accordingly. So all in all, really big month for all of our connectors. You know, these are some pretty significant improvements to four of our frequently used connectors. The last Power BI desktop feature this month is an improvement for signing in if you are a user who are, is part of multiple clouds. So you likely probably know that Power BI, it has three separate national clouds in addition to our public cloud that most people are using. And these are great, these national clouds are great because they offer the same level of security, privacy, compliance, and transparency, all those great things that our global version of Power BI has. But combined with a unique model for, a unique model for local reg regulations that may be important for the region you're in. So if your account that you're signing into Power BI Desktop with happens to be provisioned for more than one cloud, you can now choose which of the clouds you want to use when signing into the desktop. And then that means anytime you go and publish after signing in, you're automatically published to the cloud that you specified. Lastly, before ending my video, I do want to put a plug in for the Microsoft Business Application Summit. So this is a summit that's going to be held in Seattle, July 22nd to 24th, and it's going to be a lot of fun. There's a lot of um, good ways to connect with the community and collaborate, and you'll get lots of different Power BI sessions in addition to great sessions around Power Apps and Flow and Dynamics and all of the great um, business applications related tools that that Microsoft offers and of course you're going to get to meet lots of people from the Power BI team as well I'll be there and a lot of the other PMs and engineers on our team are going to be there as well so I definitely recommend registering uh, there'll be a link in the description and also on the blog itself so please do go and register uh, to come and see us all in Seattle so that's it for this month uh, Make sure to try out all these great features and give us your feedback and be on the lookout in July 
for our next release. <laughs>